I feel very lucky in the family I grew up in. My mother was a teacher, my father was a building contractor, both were athletes, my mother having trained the Olympics in Hawaii in the 1920s and making the semifinals in freestyle swimming. Uh, my father was a great tennis player and a wonderful gardener and I grew up working in the yard. I had two sisters, one two years older, who became a teacher and a writer of children's books, and my younger sister was the great athlete of the family. We were all expected to work one hour a weekend in the garden, uh, but I hated iron, and I traded with my sisters. I would do their gardening uh, if they would do my ironing and my cleaning chores. So I grew up with a love of gardening, and I find it's when I'm most peaceful and I'm very lucky to have a home where I've been able to have a rose garden and be able to raise flowers, but this was the direct influence of my father. But we had a very, very active family. Um, a family vacation would be to go camping at the beach, take our two dogs, uh, swim, cook out, uh, go hiking. We were always very, very active. In fact, when people would often ask me, well, did your parents supervise your homework? Well, it was quite the opposite because after dinner, my dad said, let's just have a game. It would be pinnacle, it would be hearts, it would be bridge. And I said, but dad, I've got homework. Oh, you can do the homework. Well, even when we were eating dinner, we grew up in an old fashioned home in the middle of Los Angeles. While we were having dinner, uh, Neighbors would just walk in, the children would go upstairs to the playroom, men or women would sit in the living room, put up the card table, and start playing bridge or pinochle or whatever. And I always kept praying there'd be a fourth before we finished with dinner, because if not, my dad was a just one rubber Dorothy, just. So I guess I had to study harder when I had the time to study, but our family did love playing games. My dad and I never understood why well, they always wanted our friends at our house. We had a badminton court, an archery range, um, we had ping pong, we had all sorts of games and when I became a mother I understood. I always knew where we were, who we were with, and everybody felt welcome at our home. Now my father being a bill contractor, we building contractor, we went through very good days where we would have a chauffeur, a cook, and a maid, and days where we moved down to our little one bedroom beach house in Seal Beach during the Depression where my dad lost everything. Some of the happiest days of our lives, as a matter of fact. Um, so we saw all sorts of life. It, during my childhood, my parents, during the good times, joined a club called the Jonathan Club. We had Saturdays, we had fencing lessons, swimming lessons, um, dance lessons, and <clears throat> those were wonderfully fun times uh, for my sisters and for me. There was a downtown club and a beach club. But when I became a teenager, I found out that the Jonathan Club discriminated against people of other races and people of the Jewish faith. And happily, that came at a downturn in my family's um, wealth, and they had to give up the membership in the Jonathan Club. But I was always disturbed that my parents would belong to something like that. And I remember when I was student body vice president at UCLA, President Sproul, the president of the university, selected a few students from each of the California campuses to belong to the California club, a sort of a, a student leadership club. We had homecoming at UCLA one year, and I called my folks, who always said yes. After the parade, could we come to our house we could play volleyball, we could play ping pong, we could have food, and at that time, uh, Jim was my partner, and uh, 
I said, we'll pick up the food. As I was driving home, I realized the president of UCLA was African American. The president of Santa Barbara was African American. The president of Davis was African American. Oh, all of whom belonged to the California Club. I walked in the door and there was my dad playing ping pong with those three in particular. Then later my dad was out at the barbecue with those three in particular. And I, after the party was over, he said, Dorothy, that was the best party you ever gave. I realized he had grown up in Nebraska where it was common and especially among building contractors to talk about people of other races because my mother was very active in the United Nations, wrote a column for the United Nations for many years. And <laughs> she was open to diversity in our home and was always very open to talking with people of other religions and races. I remember when we had Ralph Bunch to lunch, the Nobel Prize winner, my mother told everybody in the world. But I soon realized that she still had qualms about our dating anybody of a different race. And then when I became student body vice president of UCLA, one of my best friends, Cheryl Luke, was African American. And we'd gone to junior high and high school together my mother loved Mrs. Luke, and then I began to see her relating to people of other races on a different basis. But I remember in my childhood that that did bother me. I remember we were high Episcopalians. My great uncle was a minister of the Church of England, and I remember I was uh, of course, baptized in the Episcopal Church and then confirmed at age 13, and I had to go for six weeks of lessons. I asked Bishop Gooden, why are the Christians the ones who are going to be saved? What about the Buddhists? What about the Hindus? What about the Jews? What about the Muslims? And he looked at me Young lady, you'll understand when you grow up. And so I guess I was always primed to be looking for the Baha'i faith, which of course believes in progressive revelation and that all these messengers come in every 500 to 1,000 years apart. But the attitudes in the neighborhoods uh, when the Japanese were sent to these camps, my mother was the first to speak up against it. And that made me very proud. So I would say sometimes I would hear things in my home that were derogatory about people of other races or religions. But my family, on a person-to-person -person basis, accepted everyone, which had a great influence on my life. One of the happiest times for me, uh, when I was in the 11th grade, uh, my sister, older sister, was working as a counselor in the summer camp for the Culver Poems YMCA. And she asked if I'd like to work one summer, and I did, and guess who was there? My husband-to-be in the future. I had a boys club of 18 little eight-year-olds called the Gorillas. They named themselves in a boys club of 18. He had a boys club of 18 little eight-year-olds called the Cherokees. We take them on field trips and I took my gorillas on a field trip to the Santa Monica Pier to go fishing. And as we were fishing, little Herbie sitting next to me always, Dorothy, Dorothy, the Cherokees are coming. And in those days it was politically correct to wear little feathers. Well, we were on one side of the pier, and did they come and sit with us? No, they went to the other side of the pier. Well, the next Saturday, I took my kids up to the observatory. 
uh, up at Griffith Park. He had a nice mile hike up to the observatory, and as we're halfway up, Herbie said, Dorothy, Dorothy, the Cherokees are following us. And we looked down, and certainly enough, little feathers were coming up the trail. This time, I waited at the top, and my husband-to-be, Jim, who was really the director of the camp, and I was the swimming director, uh, he said, say, why don't we take our field trips together? I said, that sounds good to me. And from that on, time on, we took our field trips together. The Navy sent him to Stanford for his freshman year. Uh, he was a year ahead of me, but I went to UCLA. And after a year, he got the Navy to transfer him to UCLA. And so it was a long courtship. Jim was accepted at Stanford Medical School. Uh, we were dating at the time, going to graduate together from UCLA. And then he got a letter saying he had needed a thousand dollar microscope, he needed a four hundred dollar well, it was about twenty five hundred dollars worth of things. So for fun, he said, I'm gonna take the law school exam with you. He signed up for it. The law school exam in those days was eight hours. It's now, I think, down to four. Um, at any rate, uh, the first half of the exam was identical to the medical exam. And I was sitting two seats away from my husband-to-be. He was flipping through the exam. I learned my lesson in the bar exam. He sat in the back of the room, and I sat in the front of the room. We did go ahead and get married. Uh, in those days, people did not <laughs> live with each other before marriage, and, but we studied at his house or my house. So we got married the middle of our first year of law school. Uh, sort of silly, because it was before my final exams in December, after his. Uh, really a silly time to get married. And it was just at that time that we had begun going to Baha'i firesides to learn something about the Baha'i faith. And then finally I had a very large wedding. Oh, I was not yet a Baha'i, nor was Jim. And I didn't do very well my very first semester in law school. But happily, it was the second class at the school, and we had as our deed emeritus, brought from Harvard, the famous Roscoe Pound, one of the most great philosophers and writers of the 20th century. At any rate, I did well in his class. I did not do so well in the other classes. And I thought to myself, well, I'm just married. Maybe I'll drop out for a while. Uh, maybe I'll come back. As I was walking down the hall to see the registrar, Roscoe Pound, who was very rotund, walked down the hall waving papers in his hand. He didn't know I had been married. He said, Miss Wright, Miss Wright, brilliant. I said, is he talking to me? I had lost all my self-esteem. I was used to getting very good grades. If I did not get very good grades. But I'd taken Latin for three years in his course. If you had a knowledge of Latin, it was called common law actions, you did very well. So I took all my papers into his office, asked if he would look at them. He took one look at my contracts paper and then began to laugh. Hoo, ho, ho. Miss Wright, you're showing off. But you're just regurgitating everything you read. All they wanted to know should A, recover from B. That had a profound influence on my life and led me to having students take practice exams when I became dean of the SC Law School. When we went to law school, I went to UCLA, but my husband went to Loyola Law School because they only went from 8 to 12 in the morning and he took a job to support us, although he had his Navy a pay as well. Well, 
In my class of 72, we were the second class at UCLA. It's just a brand new law school. We were all invited to join a legal fraternity. We all joined, but six weeks later, the national of the fraternity in Chicago wrote, sorry, no women, no blacks. There were two women in my class. It was me and my friend Ann Mobley, and then the former student vice, student body president of UCLA, Cheryl Luke. President of our class, Donald Barrett, called us together and said, this is wrong. Now mind you, this was 1950, before Brown versus Board of Education. Let's all resign and form the UCLA Law Society. Everybody resigned, and we did that. I had known Donald in undergraduate school. He was a big time politician, but honestly, I didn't think he had a serious thought in his head. And I went up to him and said, Donald, whatever led you to do that? That was such a nice thing to do. He said, my whole life is changing. I'll be going to Baha'i meetings in Westwood Village. I said, oh, that must be Buddhist. I never heard of it. No, 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 it must be Hindu. No, it's an independent world religion, the latest chapter in the Book of God, which teaches that every 500 to 1,000 years, a new messenger or manifestation of God appears, gives the spiritual laws, fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, power of prayer, golden rule, immortality of the soul, but then brings new social laws. We believe that a nobleman who claimed his message in 1863 in Persia, now Iran, is the promised one of all ages. And he teaches that equality of women and men, the abolition of prejudice, of racism, of all of those things. Would you like to come to a meeting? And I said, oh no, thank you, Donald. I'm very active in my own church and Jim is in his. He did a sneaky thing. He wasn't a Baha'i. We were starving law students living on hamburgers, and, well, actually hot dogs, and macaroni and cheese. Had us to a steak dinner to play bridge. As he passed out the cards, he said, say, there is a Baha'i meeting going on a few blocks away. Would you like to go? Well, we were obviously free for the evening. And I gave a look to my husband, and he gave a look to me, and I said, well, what can we say after a steak dinner? That would be very interesting. As we got in our car, my husband Jim said to me, let's sit close to the door in case it's weird. Well, obviously it wasn't weird. And it was in Westwood Village at the home of Maury and Lowy Willows. Um, we went to their firesides for, from 1950 to 1950. 54. Walking in with our legal plaids, my husband was a scholar of the Old and New Testaments, and he could cite chapter and verse. I had gold stars in Sunday school, but I couldn't cite chapter and verse. But on the basis of that one righteous act, 17 members of my class became Baha'is in the next 10 years and they're all over the world. Unfortunately, Donald Barrett is no longer alive. Having become Baha'is together, my husband was really, it was so wonderful to be, we would read from the writings every night to each other. And then it would get late, and I'd say we have to get up in the morning, but it was one of the best training grounds for becoming a Baha'i. Well, the interesting thing is the Willows made us godparents of all of their children. And their middle child, Kim, when Jim and I were teaching Sunday school, um, actually we were teaching at a summer school in Santa Cruz, we were teaching the nine-year-olds, Kim Willows came up to me and said, Mrs. Nelson, I'm going to marry your son when I grow up. And I said, oh, well, that's very nice, Kim. Lo and behold, Franklin and Kim are married. 
So he married my godchild, and this all came about uh, because we were Baha'is. But there's one other thing that I'd like to mention. In our home, we've been very privileged to have many outstanding Baha'i presenters, including great Baha'i teachers who were called Hands of the Cause. And when we were asked to come and do some work for the Universal House of Justice, way back in 1965, uh, I took my sabbatical, we were on sabbatical, um, we, didn't, we stayed six weeks in the Holy Land, and then my sister was ill and we came home. But I had my little four-year-old daughter and my seven-year-old son. And when we went to the shrines of the predecessor of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, uh, in Haifa, Israel, one of these great teachers, Mr. Fazy, was with us. I said, Mr. Fazy, and I took my daughter Lorna's hand and said, we'll stay outside because there were about 15 people going into the shrine. Well, Mr. Frazee grabbed her hand, said, she's coming with me. And we went into the shrine of the Bob, beautiful, and as is the custom, Mr. Fazy and Lorna bowed their heads to the threshold. And all of a sudden I heard, greater is God than every great one coming from my four-year-old. Mr. Fazy turned around and said, never underestimate your children. We learned so many lessons from them. Uh, Mr. Fazy, Mr. Sears, both of whom spoke at our home, and then members of the Universal House of Justice. My daughter grew up not liking crowds. She's just fine when we have a small number of people. And I learned a lot because we were on fire as Baha'is. And I felt that we ought to be doing everything. And at the Sunday school at our house, we had the firesides at our house, we went to summer school. But I feel very privileged that they were able to grow up and acquire the incredible, not only the academic knowledge, but what I call the emotional intelligence of these great Baha'i teachers. When my husband Jim and I were working for the Culver Palmas YMCA, we found that our children came from underprivileged homes and often needed health care, their parents were living in poverty, and I would go to various government agencies to get them help. And responses would be, the law says this, the law says that. And I came home and said to my parents, I am not going to be a social worker, which I thought I might be. I'm going to be a lawyer because I am going to change some of these laws. So when people often ask me, did you always want to be a lawyer? Well, I like being in charge and making things happen. In fact, when I was in grammar school, I was in a public school called Wilton Place, but it had a, an opportunity room for some of us between the ages of A2 and A5, got to do our own work, grade our own papers, write our own essays, Whenever we wanted to, we could go paint a picture and so forth. And when I was in the fourth grade, Mrs. Henry, our teacher, said, I have a medical appointment and the principal will check on you. I'll be gone three hours, but Dorothy is going to be your teacher for those three hours. Well, I'll tell you, I enjoyed being in charge <laughs> and I thought, Everything that I would belong to, I remember when we went to our first uh, Baha'i meeting, I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted to start on time. I wanted everybody to be perfect. And I realized that life is a process of learning how to do things. But when I got to law school, I didn't like the adversary system. I didn't like pitting people against another and oftentimes not arriving at the truth and not bringing about justice. So I was really 
so thrilled with the Baha'i faith that a means of resolving conflict peacefully is consultation, a high form of mediation. And so becoming a Baha'i really directed my whole life because although I taught other courses, when I became the first woman faculty member uh, at the USC Law School, I had a course in law reform and I added mediation. And I may have told you this before, but when I went to my, <clears throat> one of my faculty meetings, I was the only woman on the faculty at the end of the table, a professor said, what is Dorothy teaching? Mediation, which consultation is a very high form of mediation. That's not law, and the response was, oh, she's just trying to make people love each other. And it really gives me a great deal of satisfaction to know that it's the hottest topic in the justice system today. And mediation as opposed to litigation is traveling the world. Some people have certain kinds of mediation which don't quite live up to the Baha'i standards because the Baha'i standard is one where you together, you listen to each other and listening is a big part of, the, of mediation rather than telling people what to do. But back to my fourth grade experience, oftentimes in meetings with my husband, I would say, I wish they would do such and such. And my husband always would say, sweetheart, you're not in charge. And learning how not to be in charge, uh, knowing that all of us make mistakes and we all have to make mistakes to learn. Uh, it's been a great learning process in my life. One of the great joys of my life was serving on the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States for 40 years. It meant going to Wilmette every single month, leaving on a Wednesday night, and being there Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We, the members of the assembly were so diverse, so talented, and such a joy to be around that I regarded them really as my second family. And the happy part was that for 22 years of that time, my husband was on the assembly. We got to fly together. And for 19 of those years, he was chair of the assembly. And to see the faith grow and develop, it gave you such a feeling that God's kingdom on earth is going to happen because of the most wonderful, dedicated, sacrificial people. And I learned so much from them all. I remember one discussion about what to do with our youth. This was early on when I was on the National Assembly. And <clears throat> the chair went around and everyone spoke until it got to Franklin Kahn, our Navajo member of the National Assembly. He spoke few words, but they were profound. He said, take the youth outside. Don't meet with them inside unless you have to. And my children were the beneficiaries of that thesis about what youth want. My son spent some time on the Navajo Reservation. He got to ride ponies. Uh, <laughs> when I sent him there for a week conference, I gave him seven pairs of shirts, seven underwear, his seven towels and so forth, wrapped up in his sleeping bag. He only used one of each the whole time because, Mom, Indian boys know how to have fun. It was just a wonderful experience. Also, we had on our assembly people who knew a great deal about the history of the faith, <clears throat> such as uh, Farouz Gazem today, we had uh, marvelous, marvelous administrators. Uh, 
my husband's first court clerk, who, before she was a Baha'i and Jim was on the fast, and she asked him, aren't you going to go to lunch? And he said, no, this is the Baha'i fast. What are you going to do? I'm going to read the Baha'i writings. Well, she left and came back five minutes later and said, I want to read them too. I can't eat when you're not eating. And of course, she later became a member of the National Spiritual Assembly and uh, a secretary and uh, treasurer of the National Assembly uh, and a wonderful, wonderful administrator in her own right. And so I would say, and working with the National Spiritual Assembly and also traveling with them to Indian reservations, to the South, uh, to Haifa together to meet with the Universal House of Justice gave me a grounding in our faith that helped me learn, grow, and develop in a way I would never have on my own tell you a little bit about my daily life, particularly since my husband died five years ago. I am a federal judge at the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. There are 13 circuits. We're the largest. And we cover the nine western states. Federal judges are appointed for life. I could retire now. I've been on the bench 35 years and just had a grand celebration. But I've been working to work down, I'm 87 years old, to a lesser load, which you're permitted to do as a senior judge. You, you could get paid for the rest of your life and just not work anymore. But I love my family at the courthouse, and so I sit on cases of all kinds. I have chambers in San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, Anchorage, and Honolulu, my favorite. But as a senior judge now, I am only holding court. Um, I was sitting instead of five days a week, I'll sit two or three days a week, six times a year. A full load, load is five days a week. But I also, right next to my courthouse, I, we established, some of us, uh, based on the Baha'i principle of consultation, I might add, the Western Justice Center to promote peaceful resolution of conflict among children in the courts and in the community. I spent a lot of time there. I was chairman of the board uh, from 1985 until 2005, but uh, happily I'm chair emerita. But what we do, we teach children how to be peer mediators and we actually, we teach the teachers how to teach the children. And every year we have what we call a peer mediation invitational. We had over a hundred students from elementary school. And then we had over a hundred from junior high and high on a separate day. And they come and they practice their mediation skills in front of trained mediators. Uh, many of them are judges who've been trained as mediators. We train teachers and we set up models for solving problems, say on the campuses, dealing with racism, dealing with sexism. And we have joined with the Los Angeles School for the Arts to put on plays for children at these schools dealing with these subjects, which are very popular. We have a program called School Tools, where online, for free, teachers may acquire tools for teaching about mediation, uh, including videos, including worksheets and working plans, and it's been picked up in countries around the world. We also work with adult community people. We have a program called Work It Out at Work, how people in their own business uh, businesses can solve problems under the principle uh, of consultation and mediation. The most fun for me is when a school permits their kids to come at the end of the year and I take them in our big courtroom and have them mediate a case and litigate a case. My favorite group were a bunch of fourth graders. The case was a 
child gets an F, thinks she deserved at least a C. Fourth grade lawyer for the child, fourth grade lawyer for the teacher, the rest got to be judges in our big courtroom. Little Herbie again, it's always a Herbie. <laughs> As he'd been taught, said, may it please the court, my client got an F because the teacher is a racist. First words out of his mouth. He had other arguments. Fourth grade lawyer for the teacher, may it please the court, my client, Mrs. Brown, cannot teach 28 children. If they come to school, don't do their homework, fall asleep in class. Little Herbie gets up, may it please the court, my client falls asleep because she comes to school without breakfast. Well, everybody conferred, Herbie won, George lost. Then they mediated. Hello, my name is George. This is my teacher, Mrs. Brown. Hello, my name is Herbie. This is my client, Laura. Laura, tell Mrs. Brown how you feel about that F. I hate school. My parents are mad at me. I never want to go to school again. Little George, Mrs. Brown, tell Laura how you feel. I cannot teach. Laura, I love you. This is make-believe. But I can't teach 28 children if you don't do your homework and you fall asleep in class. Those fourth graders decided the teacher should stay after school, tutor Laura, because she shouldn't be given a grade she didn't earn. That someone ought to write the PTA that children are coming to school without breakfast. What pleased me about this group, it was make-believe. We're fourth graders, we can solve problems. They hugged each other. And then we give them pizza supplied or Mexican food supplied by former students of mine. As for the future, because I'm a Baha'i, I am very optimistic. I think we're, we've been told uh, that world peace is going to come about. This is in our writings. But either through unimaginable horrors, some of which we're experiencing now, or we could do it tomorrow through an act of consultative will. All over the world, Baha'i communities in a non-partisan political way are building communities toward the aim of the unity of mankind. And this is in hundreds of communities and in thousands uh, of places. And I've traveled the world and I see these communities working. I see it in my own community in Pasadena, uh, overcoming problems in the city. Uh, we met with the Human Relations Committee uh, of Pasadena and they took a vote some years ago to make the Pasadena school system the first prejudice-free system in the United States. And they've been taking measures uh, to bring this about. We looked around our community, how can we help the community? Well, we found that we have one Hispanic section in our community of very, very upset people. And we met with some community groups and one group has started this program of have a person of a different background, race or religion, to dinner once a month. We have wealthy Pasadenians, we have middle, and we have very poor. And a mother's club has been arranging these dinners and they range from tacos to Persian food. One of the first things some of the owners of businesses here said, the Hispanic people said, why are you hiring people from Santa Monica to work in your restaurants? And they said, well, we've, people we've used before we have experienced people, and with just that kind of exchange and consultation, the businesses in Pasadena began to hire more Hispanics than they ever had before. So if we bring people together and they can consult and talk about their issues, we start in our little community. It's moving to the nation and it's moving to the world. And so people get upset you know, how can you be optimistic when all of this has happened? Well, I think this comes from a belief that we're only on this earth for a short period of time. And as we move on, we're moving into onto a glorious place. But our job, as Baha'is we believe, is to know and love God and to carry forward an ever-advancing civilization. 
And the son of the prophet founder, prophet founder Baha'u'llah, his son Abdul Baha, would walk into a room and say, are you happy? If not, when will you be? He didn't mean with your car or your house or whatever. He meant, are you happy in your heart? And I've learned that the heart has a little brain of its own. And that the way to true happiness is to serve others. So we have firesides at our home every Wednesday. And we find that people of all backgrounds are troubled. One of the ways to work your way out of being troubled is to do something for somebody else and make your community better. So I, I feel and always have been ever since the moment I became Baha'i. It was what I was looking for. It is a message of hope. It's a realistic message because I've seen when I became a Baha'i in 1954, I think we had 5,000 Baha'is. We now have close to 200,000. And that's a short period of time. And this era, we believe, is going to last not less than 1,000 years when another messenger will come. But by golly, we're doing it, and we're doing it better every day. Mm -hmm.